And then importantly, the third step is to draw a picture. Now many groups were pretty reluctant to draw a picture of the human body. I don't know why. It's not hard. There's a stomach, there's an intestinal tract, there's a blood system. I really, really encourage you to draw a picture of the human body and define importantly here, when we're drawing a picture, we're not just drawing a picture of a reactor or the stomach or of the, the veins in the body or the intestines. The aim of the picture is to identify the boundaries. Okay, so when I draw a PFR on the board or a CSPR, I'm drawing it to show you what is the boundary of my system. What is inside that reality? Okay, so to identify the boundary. Once you do that, it becomes very, very clear what type of reactor to use. Okay? Now, this particular question in the tutorial 7, that single question, is phenomenally important. You cannot see by the chemical engineering problem, but many of you will go on and study medicine. Okay? A number of you will, that's always the case. And for those of you who study medicine, you will be on the body as various types of reactors. So your intestine is most commonly modeled as a particle reactor. Your stomach is modeled as a batch. Your blood system is modeled as well. I will need you to figure out what type of system is modeled as. Okay. CSTR, batch, particle reactor. Think about it carefully. So when you think about it, Consider what is a CSTR? What features does a CSTR have? Inflow and outflow. What features does a blood flow reactor have? Inflow and outflow as well. A batch does not have inflow and outflow. So when you think about choosing an appropriate reactor to model body part with, it needs to match up with the same characteristics of the reactors we've learned about so far. So this problem isn't just important for those of you that go and study medicine. It's also important for those of you that will are in the bio stream. We will, or you will, if you take some of your pharmacokinetics courses, model the body as well as reactors. Okay? And so this is widely used in, the, in that industry. Another example of this sort of problem is to model the rate of alcohol being, uh, well, first you absorb alcohol into your body by but then you can also model the rate at which alcohol is desorbed, and you can basically calculate the amount of time it requires to sober up before you dry. Okay, so those sorts of calculations are, are widely done, and they're done using these models of the reactor. So this is a great problem for all the students, but most, most importantly, it's a great problem because it's going to help you really figure out what goes in each of these steps and, and look at the strategy for solving the problem. So that's going to uh, probably bother the group tomorrow a bit. And then on Wednesday's class, I'll talk a little bit more about the problem. And we'll talk about some of the ways you can solve it numerically in, in Polymat. But spend most of the tutorial time really getting your system set up and planning on your strategy. Don't worry about, it, about doing this. That step will take about 10, 20 minutes once you've got it set up. So, when we talk about planning the strategy, here's the strategy you will follow. For all these problems, not just for this tutorial problem, but in general for multiple species systems, which includes the course project. So let's take a look at the algorithm. Once again, for multiple reactions. I.e. the planning step. So this is the strategy you follow for that plan. The first step is to determine the reactor type. Okay, and this was a, a frustrating part for most people in today's tutorial, figuring out what type of reactor to use in different parts of the body. But once you've got that figured out, then the second step is straightforward. We write out the design equation. For that reactor. 
Okay, so we've seen that before. This is the normal part of our strategy. But what's added to this when we're looking at multiple reactions, we not only write out the design equation for that reactor, we repeat it for every species. Then we simply plug away at those equations. The third step is to fill in the rates. In the design equation. So all the design equations for plug flow, for CSTR, for batches, they all have a rate term in them, minus RA or plus RA. So once we know our design equation, which we know because we picked our reactor, we're simply substituting the rates in the design equation. But we do that not just once, we do it for every reaction present. Okay, so in multiple reaction situation, we have more than one reaction present. And again, another people, another problem people found frustrating in today's tutorial is just figuring out what the reactions are. So again, here, what are they? So when you plan your strategy here, figure out what your species are, figure out what your reactions are, figure out what your reactor types are. Once you've got that all set up, the problem is pretty straightforward. Now. So in the class last time, we looked at an example. And I will just quickly recap that example numerically here on the board, but I did want to, before I go into the polymath code, just quickly talk about where we ended off at the previous class. And that was we were looking at this new concept of yield and overall selectivity. So previously we defined instantaneous selectivity. So S B U was instantaneous selectivity. And that was defined as the rate of the desired product being formed over the rate of the undesired product. We also defined a new term, S tilde DOU, which we called the overall selectivity. And that was given by the exit flow or exit concentration. divided by the exit flow or exit concentration of U. And the reason why we have either or in the numerator and denominator is because we will use, we'll use flow of D and flow of U in the situation for a flood flow reactor. And we'll use concentration in the case of the batch reactors.
Now, there is the reason why we have these differences is I let's just talk about those before we get into the numerics again in the polygon. There's a reason why we introduce these, and that's one is we're looking at them from economic aspects as well as reactor design aspects. So there's a bit of an interplay between the two that we need to be aware of, and tonight's example will show will show some of that. So the main the main issue is we would like to maximize our selectivity, our overall selectivity, and our overall yield. Right? It's clear all three of those are things we would want to be high. But we have to trade off some sometimes. So let's just take a look at this. Overall selectivity and overall yield. my overall selectivity, in other words, I'm increasing the flow or concentration of the desired species and minimizing this undesired species, it's quite clear that my economics are going to be boosted. Okay. I'm going to have a greater concentration of D, the desired product, and a lower concentration of U. Same thing here. Right? The moles of D that I form, if I'm maximizing yield, I'm getting a high number of moles of D, and I'm consuming all my reactors. Okay? If yield is decreasing or decreased in some way, it means either I'm forming lower moles of D, my moles of desired product are maybe being disappeared by an undesired side reaction, or it means that somehow my moles of reactants are not being completely converted over to D. Either way, I've got a problem. Right? I'm making my desired product go away, I'm using my over there. Or if I'm incompletely reacting my raw material, I've got a problem. I have to separate that raw material A, let's say, from D later on. So I'm going to have to spend money later on on separating D from A. So it's quite clear from an economic perspective, we'd like both of these numbers to be high. Okay, so let's just add that say, make both high. where possible, we'll maximize them. The reason why we consider instantaneous selectivity, so SDU, in other words, instantaneous selectivity, we had a bit of a discussion uh, one or two classes ago where we were using instantaneous selectivity to help guide our choice of reactor. So that's why that, that term is important. Then finally, there's also conversion. We seem to have forgotten a bit about conversion. We haven't used it in the past few classes. But we're used to, at least from earlier classes, to say let's try to maximize conversion. Well, not always, right? So conversion x, conversion x, we should try to get that high. low selectivity and low yield. So conversion x should be higher maximized, but this often leads to low selectivity or yield. Or I should say and yield. So it often leads to low overall selectivity or D with respect to undesired and low overall yield of the desired product. So I will, I will, um, we'll look at that in another example in this class. Okay. Okay. So let's 
just quickly recap where we were uh, in the previous example to give you some context again. We were looking last time at a batch reactor, and we had two reactions occurring. So in tonight's class, we'll, we'll just quickly recap the batch reactor. Then we're going to say, well, let's see what would happen if we do this in a CSTR, and then compare the two of them and figure out which would be the better choice in this situation. So last time, <coughs> had A going to be with a certain reaction rate K1 of 0.5 hours. And we also had A, uh, sorry, B then going on to C. And that occurred at a slower rate. Okay, so B is desired. and C is my undivided. And we were doing this in a batch reactor, and last time we said basically how long do we run the batch so that we get the most amount of B produced. If we run the batch any longer than that, B is going to then start to get depleted and go to an undesired product that we're not interested in. So we set up our equations, here they are again, we won't go through that. We followed that algorithm that was on the board, where we substituted in all those rate expressions for all of the reactions. We had initial conditions for A, B, e, and C's concentration. We had my rate constants over there. And here I have now the instantaneous selectivity, the overall selectivity, and the yield expressions. Okay, so I just want to point out in last last class, to avoid division by zero in the denominator, we had this little trick that we applied where we added a small offset to prevent division by zero. One other thing that you can do, instead of doing that, this will be helpful for this next tutorial, is you can, you can use this following code instead. So I don't need to use that. One other way I could write it is to recognize that the problem occurs because at time zero, I'm getting division by zero. After time zero, I don't get division by zero. So what I can do is something that you can do in polymath, and you can also do this in MATLAB, is you can say, well, if t time is greater than some small value, so 0 0.001, then let SDU equal its regular definition. So that's the regular definition of the instantaneous selectivity. Else, it's zero. Okay. And I can do the same for every one of these three. So overall, SDU is after a small time, set it equal to its regular definition of CB divided by CC. Now I don't have to include that small offset anymore because that offset is only required really at time zero. So after time zero, I can just simply use the regular condition, CD divided by CC, L0. When you do this, Polymath will take care of that if else, and will check where time is and pick the correct substitution for the right hand and the left hand side of it. Okay? This will be useful in the tutorial because in the tutorial you have to determine when the patient should receive the dose of medicine. So every six hours, every eight hours, every ten hours. So you can do this same sort of trick then when you give the patient the dose, you can say, if time is between 5.99 and 6.01 hours, the patient takes the tablet. And so you can simulate the tablet going into the stomach and adding a, adding a dose. Okay, so if then else statements easily handled in polymath, you can do a similar construction in that lab as well. Okay, so this revised code now is then posted on the course website for you to go copy and copy down and, and practice. So what we did last class is we ran that code and we essentially found that the optimal time to run the batch is around three hours and 3.05 hours. So let me just uh, to copy down some of these numbers because we're going to compare them then to the CSTR, which we're going to look at next. So for the batch.
the main things I wanted to compare here were selectivity and yield. So for the batch system, the overall selectivity is given by this equation that defines overall SDU. And so it was in row 98 was where our optimum time was to run the batch is 2.275, so uh, 2.28 was my overall selectivity. Overall yield, that gives me the best uh, overall yield was uh, 0.69. And we can also calculate overall conversion. So the regular expression for conversion is what you start with minus what you consume divided by your initial amount and that was the calculate that is equal to 0.78. So we can get that from that simulation. I'm just putting it up here. We're going to compare it to the CSTR context. Okay, so what I strongly encourage you to do, last class we, should, we went through the code. I, I highly recommend you run the code and you plot these curves of selectivity, instantaneous selectivity, overall selectivity, and you'll understand what the profile is of those at different times for which you run the batch. It's very, very important that you have a, have a good understanding of that. So let's now switch our example over to a CSTR. Same system, just we're going to run it in a CSTR. B going to C, undesired, same race. We're interested now whether we should use a batch reactor or a CSTR. So in a CSTR, let's just draw a picture of that. I've got my reactor. I have flow in. So I've got a certain volumetric flow of FA naught coming in at a flow rate of Q, well mixed, and it's leaving at a flow rate of Q, and the molar flow of A is FA moles per second or moles per minute. So that's the regular, regular uh, way of being with the CSTR. What are some of the things that I can adjust on a CSTR? Think back to when we learned about CSTRs, what are some of the ways we can manipulate that reactor to, let's say for example, boost the yield or increase the conversion? Or how what are some of the things that you can manipulate? I can manipulate the volume. So there is a volume V here. I can choose to run this reactor, say at half the volume, or three quarters, or 90% of the volume. So volume is one thing. else we can adjust? Q, the flow rate Q. So it's volume is in liters, Q is in liters per second or liters per hour in this case. We also learned last time, we learned about a new variable which we called tau, the residence time. Let's just quickly recap that, and that's going to come into play in this particular example. And there's also a section that we skipped out earlier in the course textbook, so we'll come back. We're coming back to that section. So tau was a variable we introduced last time as the residence time. And we defined it as the volume of the reactor divided by Q. So we recognize that absolutely I can adjust the volume and I can adjust Q, but really there's an interrelationship there between it. If I make my volume bigger and keep Q constant, something happens, or if I keep V constant and I increase Q, the same thing happens. But right? there's, a, there's a play there between the two variables, and what resonance time does is it creates a single variable that allows us to more easily work with CSTR. So 
few, uh, several classes near the beginning of the course, we introduced the concept of residence time, V over Q, and if you want to translate that over, you can consider it a better term for it, a term that's used in Foley, it's called space time. Okay. Is it actually a more accurate definition for what V divided by Q is? And it is equal to the time taken to process one reactor volume. Okay, so one reactor volume, capital V, V is cubed divided by V is cubed per second. For example, that's going to get you units of seconds for tau. We're just looking at a dimensional analysis. So it's the time taken to process one reactor volume of fluid. And we're quite specific here based on entrance conditions. And the reason for that being so specific is that when we're dealing with other reactors, uh, so when we're dealing with reactors um, in gas systems, the volume of fluid changes as, as, the, as, the, as time progresses, right? So as it's reacting, it may expand or contract. So we're quite clear that volume of fluid is based on whatever the entrance conditions are. For liquid systems, that differentiation really doesn't matter too much. Q at the beginning is the same as Q at the exit. Okay, so residence time is a great way to judge a reactor's capability. It also gives you this division between volume and Q, both of which trade off and affect the reactor. But now we've got, instead of dealing with two variables and figuring out how V affects the reactor and Q affects the reactor, we simply deal with one single number and figure out how it affects the reactor. So let's go back then to our algorithm. Our algorithm said, figure out what reactor type we're dealing with. This example is we're looking at a CSTR. The next step was what? What did we need to do as the next step in the, in the plan? Recall the plan that we had at the start of the class up on the board over there? What's the next step I do? So I know my reaction is CSTR. Great. Great. Do I have my rate expressions? Design equation for every species. So the design equation for a CSTR. What's that again? Design equation for every species. The general design equation is V is the flow in minus the flow out divided by the negative rate. Or in other words, the rate of consumption of that species. Okay, so this is the general equation for the J species. So it tells us we write the design equation for every species. So let's substitute in here at least just for A. Initially, FA0 minus FA divided by minus RA is what that would be. Okay, and I could also write for, C, for B. So FB0 minus FB divided by minus RA and so forth. Now I've only got A, species A, B, and C. So write the design equation for every species. The third step is to substitute in what those rates are. <laughs> Let's just quickly recap from last class we had in the example, so we won't re re-derive this. So I'll simply state it up, up here. Now those rates were minus RA is K1CA. The rate of disappearance of B is equal to minus K1CA minus K2CB. 
Okay, so notice I'm putting this all inside the brackets with the negative because this is minus RV. Last class we, we just derived RV, so we need the negative of the rates. So that's why I'm writing it like this. And then minus RC is equal to minus K2C. Okay, so we, we derived that last class. That's the third step in the algorithm. Substitute in the rate for every reaction. So those are those are what we derived there. Now there's a, a small issue here. We're not given flows for the CSTR. We are given concentrations though. We, we know that the inlet concentration in the CSTR is two moles per liter. Uh, sorry, two moles, yeah, two moles per liter. because at the end we want to make a fair comparison between the batch system and the CSTR. So we don't know flows, however, but we can use the relationship that FA is equal to CA times Q, or FA naught would be CA naught times Q in this case. Okay, so then if I substitute that into my design equation, I can rewrite my design equation actually slightly differently. Let's say use these in the design equation. So now I can write V is equal to, well instead of FA naught, I can substitute in CA naught Q minus FA is CA times Q divided by minus RA. I can factor out a common Q, CA naught minus CA over minus RA. Or, in fact, I can do it a little bit more like V over Q is equal to CA naught minus CA over minus RA. Okay. And the reason why I, I want to do that is because V over Q is tau, the residence time. So that that gets me to a, uh, a nice value, tau, which I prefer to use rather than V and Q separately. Now, of course, I can go repeat this for species B and species C. What you'll find then is that this is equal to that same tau, the same residence time as CB naught minus CD over minus RB which is equal to CC naught minus CC over minus RC. So let's just let's just step back here for a minute. I've got A going to B and then B reacting away to C. My goal is to find the way to operate my CSTR so that I get maximum B. If I operate with a really low flow rate in that CSTR, I'm going to form B, but then B is going to start reacting to C. So I'm, if I operate with a low flow rate into that CSTR, A is going to go to B, but because the material is going to stay around in the reactor at low flows, it's going to give B opportunity to go over to C. If I operate at really high flow rates coming into the reactor, A is going to go to some amount of B, and then less of it is going to go to C, but I'm also not going to form a whole lot of B either if I operate at low flows. So there's definitely a trade-off here on how I operate that reactor, either with low flows or high flows. And I can make the same argument for volume. Right? If I operate at low volumes, I'm going to get um, low volumes, I'm going to get small amounts of B forming, high volumes, I'm going to get large amounts of B forming, but then B is going to go to C. So, definitely a trade off there, and this is what we're going to investigate. What is the residence time tau that I should use to get maximum concentration of B? So, let me take a look at my equations here. I've got tau equal to V over Q, so 
let's just, just write that as tau. Switch those around. The reason for that is I've got, essentially I've got one equation here. Tau is equal to CA naught minus CA or minus RA. Tau is equal to a second equation. So here's equation one. I've got equation two. And I've got equation three. Three equations. Three linear or nonlinear equations and how many unknowns. What, what do I know, what don't I know in these equations? So again, it's back to how many unknowns so far? There's tau. Let's just uh, make note of it here. Unknowns. So there's tau CA. I know CA naught minus RA. I, it's only a function of CA, so it's still the same number of unknowns. Let's go to the next equation. Do I know CB naught? Yeah. CB naught. Do I know CD? No. CV is an unknown, it's the concentration of B leaving my CSGR. This is in fact the one we want to maximize. Okay, so we want this to be greatest. Do I know RB or minus RB? So RB is equal to a function of K1 and K2, which I do know, but it's a function also of CA and CV, which I don't know. So my list here is still same list. Three unknowns, three equations, but there's one more equation to consider. Do I know CC naught? Yes, it's zero. CC though is another unknown. And then minus RC is a function of CV and K2. Four unknowns, three equations. Okay, so what do we do in this situation? Can I delete an equation? If I delete an equation, I need a, an equation for every species. That's what my plan, plan says. So I've got an equation for CA, CB, CC. The only thing I can do is specify one of my variables. So either set CA, CB, or CC, or tau. So what I'd rather do is I'd rather set tau and then calculate the other three. And then I'll repeat that at different values of the residence time tau, and then build up the plot. Okay, so this is very common in engineering systems. When we've got one extra unknown relative to the number of equations we have, we use this unknown as a variable, and we plot our other three then that we subsequently calculate as a function of that variable. So we call tau then our parameter that we're going to adjust. And then these other three will be automatically set once I've <coughs> calculated that parameter. So let's take a look at that then. Four equations, three unknowns. One thing I can do though to make my life a little easier is try to sub in over here and just deal with one equation at a time. So let's take a look at that. So my first equation over there is tau. <coughs> is equal to CA0 minus CA over minus RA, and minus RA is equal to K1CA. Let me rearrange that for CA. Remember, my three variables that I'm interested in here are CA, CB, and CC. And in particular, I really want to maximize CB. So we're going to come to that problem in a minute. But let's first just tackle getting CA, CB, and CC. So if I resolve this expression in terms of CA, you can uh, show CA is equal to CA naught divided by 1 plus K1 tau. 
kind of looks like an expression you see in three peoples. And it's no coincidence. It's a hundred percent overlap. Okay? These courses are so, so close to each other. So that's no coincidence, and you will in fact find will in fact find in your React Angels uh, design course that you deal a lot with tau as one of your variables, and tau affects really the speed at which your your loop operates at. Okay, it's the same same idea here in the first order of this job. So it's, top, it's not a coincidence that you're seeing that. This number K1 tau has a nice special name. It's a, like a long German name. We won't deal with it. But if, if there is a parameter in chemical engineering that goes to the it. it is also dimensionless. So K1 tau is dimensionless. Okay, so the units of K1 are inverse hours, the units of tau are hours, and so that cancels out over there. You can also uh, calculate CB and CC in terms of um, the, the remaining variables. So I'll leave this to you as very easy algebraic manipulation. It looks messy. But it's really uh, it's just two lines of summing in. So CB is equal to tau K1 CA. We know what CA is already. Divided by 1 plus K2 tau. So again, another process control type similarity here. So that's the equation for CB. And then finally, the equation for CC is equal to tau times K2 CB. Okay, and we know what CB is already. So it, it makes sense that one equation cascades into the next because this is A goes to B goes to C. So if we know what A is, here's the equation for A, concentration of A. I know that, then I can calculate what CB is. And then once I know CB, I can help get CC. So, what you do then is, and I'll encourage you to go do this at home, and we'll take this up in the next classes, in MATLAB or Excel. Find tau that gives maximum concentration of B. That gives maximum concentration of B. Also, do the following. Once you have that calculated, part two of the problem is to, to go and say, at this max, maximum, find the following three numbers. The same is for the batch process. Overall selectivity, okay, so you're going to have to look up how overall selectivity is expressed for a batch reactor. I wrote the formula earlier. So overall selectivity, overall yield, and overall conversion. Or just conversion. So you'll get three very three different numbers and the, from the batch system. So here's the three values for the batch system. Then we're going to talk about next class which you would pick, batch or CSTR. We'll talk a bit about the economics as well.